So good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today for this series of talks. This is um, a series that we created about one and a half years ago uh, with the partnership of the Institute of Computing here uh, in Campinas, Sao Paulo, Brazil, at the University of Campinas, and uh, in partnership with the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, Puki Rio, here represented today by the director, Professor Marcus Andler. Um, we have the pleasure to have here today uh, an artist that I had the pleasure to know about two or three years ago. Uh, and I was amazed of, uh, with what uh, Rafik can do uh, with AI and uh, data processing and data visualization. And then I thought uh, I would try to have him to talk to us and I invited him and he kindly accepted. And I was sort of surprised when he mentioned that he is also having this amazing uh, project uh, with uh, an indigenous peoples in the Amazon. And he will talk about that uh, later on. So uh, Rafik, thank you for joining us today for accepting this invitation. For those who don't know Rafik, he is a media artist, uh, director of uh, and pioneer in the aesthetics of machine intelligence professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, in the Department of Design, Media and Arts. So Rafik, thank you once again. And uh, the stage is all yours. Typically, we have about 45, 50 minutes for the talk and then some time for questions. But the time is all yours. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much. Super excited to be here together. Um, and I am just almost done with the with one more part so i wanna i was just updating the keynote i hope it doesn't crash <laughs> so it's a very large keynote with lots of videos um and i hope it won't be okay so i think it is cool okay i'll be sharing here we go. I'll share as a video. So because I have a lot of sound and video, hope you can hear me. Um, okay. So can you see my screen? Yes. Amazing. Okay. So I can start maybe? Yes, please go ahead. Awesome. So hello, everyone. Again, great to be here. Um, I'm a media artist and currently teaching at UCLA last eight years. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here with you because I teach since my very early ages in undergrad um, and last eight years at UCLA teaching at media arts department, focusing on art, science and technology. And where I got my second master of fine arts degree. And um, I want to today show you, um, you know, the journey that I've been going through, I think, and then how I started. Um, some key projects that I think made an impact in our journey and um, and ready for your questions to support your journey as well. So um, there will be some sound. I can, I'm happy to like, you know, change the sound and I'll talk on top of videos. I hope you can see them nicely. If not, many of these videos are available on my website or, or uh, on my social media. So you are very welcome to see them in high quality um, if you want. So I'm originally from Istanbul, Turkey, which is a very inspiring city where truly left and right, black and white, contemporary, and, you know, history is combined in a city of like multiple centuries old cultures. The city is very important to me because it's, I think, where I got the inspiration of combining physical and virtual. It's kind of always this feeling of like, you know, switching the uh, gears between two continents, you know, where the East and West physically connects. I think that's where I start imagining these worlds. And I was very lucky to get my first computer. I was eight years old, um, which maybe you know of those Commodore computers back in time. They were like super inspiring machines where I start playing games and I didn't stop playing games still, but I was super like inspired by the idea of escaping from reality and finding an inspiring time with machines such as computers here. And finding the first, I guess, encounter with AI as a, like a team member or someone that I play games. And um, what is amazing in my mind that was very different than other projects was um, 
to work with computers early ages, it, it just gave me the like confidence of machines one day can become a collaborator. Machine and algorithms can one day become a friend. Uh, I think that came from that age. The other topic that I'm really inspired a lot is um, the Blade Runner. The movie truly changed my perception about future. Um, but but I, I'm, I'm in love with science fiction since childhood. And this movie didn't brought me like this, you know, predictable dystopian world of the movie preser- um, presents. But I try to solve something different than the the very low level imagination of dystopia where you know AI takes over humanity or that kind of like doomsday scenarios or you know all sort of this drama that we are constantly hearing and feeling that was not my inspiration in fact i found that perhaps the future of um future of the future we are going is very much opening new opportunities for creators from architects designers artists who are imagining the future became, I guess, my, my fundamental inspiration. And 2008, when I was working at an incredibly, uh, unfortunately, we lost um, uh, Peter Weibel, who is uh, a pioneer media artist and the uh, founder of ZKM in Karlsruhe in Germany. And I was very fortunate to like join some of some of their arc, um, early early lectures. And I found Lev Manovich, one of my hero, and is an incredible person, speculates about you know near future. And in his talk, he was saying something powerful that hopefully one day, if architects and artists can take the next logical step, which is the making invisible data flows as substance rather than just as void, something then is a structure of politics and poetics. It's a powerful statement that I think how I started. And in my very early days, this is a software called Pure Data. Now it's an ancient software, (laughs) but it was a very fun, like Miller Phuket, who is the US, US UCSD professor, started this incredible software, open source free for mostly musicians and then visual artists. That's how I started doing programming, visual programming language. And my first experiment on a building was called uh, Quadrature, which is an audiovisual performance almost 14 now, 15 years ago, and transformed this building, which is a, a, a kind of a building of a contemporary art, turn it into a canvas. And, and it became like a more experiments in Europe, and Sana's building uh, in Germany, Essen-Werden. And later on, I was able to work with data from a street 2011 and transform the three days of sound recordings of the street into a three-dimensional sculpture. And that's where I found the power of connecting public art, public space, and art for anyone, any age, any background, and the idea of using parametric design and transform them into a uh, kind of artworks. And I'm calling them poetics of data because the process with data, when it starts like 14, 15 years ago, I always didn't feel that it's just numbers. I felt that to me, data is a form of memory and this memory can take any shape and form. And this can be a simple noise algorithm, can be whatever particle animated. But, but my obsession with algorithms and data dramatization like became a framework of my imagination, if it makes sense. And coining the term data painting 2008 really, really made me profoundly engage with many incredible people in computer science, in computer graphics, and recently AI researchers. So coming back to the idea of uh, that, you know, the idea of realism and the idea of Trump Loy is also a very inspiring research to me. Um, and also you will see a lot of frames around my work. 2011, unfortunately, it was a rejection. So we couldn't uh, allow to create this frame around the building. It was very expensive. So that became, I guess, a kind of a rejection turned into a kind of an opportunity. So if you think about data, and if you think about like this idea, by the way, Kierkegaard is a very, I mean, a hero, philosopher. He said, life only can be understood backwards but it must be lived forwards. I think it's an, exactly the situation we all as humanity doing and creating all these new you know, worlds around us through machines and hardwares and softwares. So, and if you think about physical and virtual worlds, how they are colliding, it was also my fundamental challenge almost 14 years ago when I started my research. And I knew that it's not just about personally, but it's about culturally, environmentally, globally how we are all changing. 
and how the machines that we control or we thought that we are controlling are actually controlling us. And I think both life and technology seems to be based on immaterial flows of information. And that really triggered my imagination a lot. And also, of course, sense of displacement. We are not 100% sure where we are. We don't even know if we are in the infinite settings of life or infinite worlds of imagination. And John Maida tells this very well. Design is a solution to a problem. Art is a question to a problem. So I thought this challenge and ask much challenging question in my humble view is, what does it really mean to be a human in 21st century became, I guess, our fundamental question. It was a lot of responsibility and I'm not allowed to like answer this question myself. And I never want to be as a long, lonely, I guess, journey. And this is my team right now. We are 15 people can speak 15 language and represent 10 countries in our studio. And what is amazing is like literally um, last eight years um, as a studio, we discovered incredibly uh, powerful moments. I hope you can hear the music. Yes, it's perfect. I mean, last eight years, we really look for the patterns of, you know, data in public space, neuroscience, performing arts. But you will see a common pattern that we didn't like go for lonely and alone experiences. Like we go for a public space where we come together and feel something together and understand something together. And that's, I think, the power of public art. And that's what happens when you're on the street with, the street, with everyone together without any bias or without any like borders. I do believe that art should be for everywhere. And I think putting an art in a museum or gallery or behind the walls and doors and, and I, I don't believe that's where we practice our imagination on the utmost level. And of course, there are you know pros and cons of being inside a building and being surrounded by technology. Uh, but also, I see I I found much more value and and interaction and dialogue and and constructing new realities and beyond my comfort zone. Uh, I truly like spend significant time in the streets in the cold uh, with the machines and with the you know projectors and LEDs and computers and spend so much time to learn. Um, the art in public space. And of course, as you may see here, art, science and technology brought us a powerful statement about being able to create works uh, across the world. Uh, we have 64 cities around the world, and we have multi-million people explored our works. Um, I'm very grateful for the journey, but also grateful for people who understood and reacted to the work. Um, and also very clear to say that when the art world was sleeping, the Silicon Valley was not. Being in Los Angeles 2014, opening our studio, we were very fortunate to work with NVIDIA, Google, Intel, Siemens, Epson, and many, many incredible friends in Silicon Valley where we explore super complex ideas from AI to data to algorithms, archives. So, so I just want to say that I don't believe what we do, our breakthroughs in arts will be possible without not living in Los Angeles or in California in general. I do believe that the city, the state, has a powerful support for people who have dreams about technology, about humanity, and about art, science, and technology. Um, and I'm, as you may see in this portfolio, AI, neuroscience, and architecture was always the fundamental inspiration. Quantum mechanics, quantum computation, um, memories and dreams, uh, being able to use neuroscience with a cutting edge art and AI. Um, but simply, I guess, relationship between humans, machines, and environments uh, became the fundamental uh, challenge of creating. And one project that I think many of us maybe remember in 2015, July, uh, this image popped up. Maybe you remember that. And it's, a, it's called an, in, a, The Deep Dream, the software originally uh, kind of a deep convolutional network uh, codenamed Inception. And Inception is a kind of after the film <laughs> of the same name. Uh, and it's developed for ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge. 
And this was the very first time we were seeing some really interesting moment of AI coming up as a mean of expression. And I was very fortunate to work with the same team, 2016, February, literally seven years ago, Blaze, Agora Arcas, Mike Taika, and Karen McDowell. I was the first artisan resident at Google and I was able to start my journey as an AI artist. But as, as Blaze also predicts that, like any invention in the history of humanity, it was a clearly predictable thing that machine intelligence, specifically AI, is an innovation that will profoundly affect art. And seven years ago, we were 100% sure about that. But to me, what was much inspiring is how can we quantify consciousness and how can we use AI to simulate consciousness, not necessarily mimic humanity, take over humans, create robots, or like do, do all these like weird doomsday, you know, uh, imagination, but how can we understand who we are and how can we learn our cognitive capacity? And if you look at like latent space concept, which for AI, maybe you are, a f you are familiar, when information is stored in the mind of a machine or a mind is in this case, latent space is a really inspiring moment of imagination because latent space means that like, let's say an AI learned from 10 to 24 dimensions and how we can perceive multi-dimensional universe. I mean, right now, multimodal AI research, like text to image, text to video, and other things are pretty much happening in the latent space. But we are asking questions. We are interacting these models to make them much smarter and also respond to us much faster. But I think, as Carl Sagan says, imagination is extremely important, even with AI. So AI is not uh, just a technology that like creates a negativity or positivity. It's still our imagination is what happens. So I will say, I mean, it's a great, I mean, analogy, art questions the world around us. Science explains world around us. Design articulates the solution. Technology enables the solution. So they are all connected to each other. We just need an imagination. So my first, I mean, inspiration was the Borges, which an incredible story of Library of Babel. But my, I guess, understanding in here was like decentralized knowledge in humanity and turning this information into a library of the humanity, library of the future, where everything exists and where AI help us to navigate from this infinite amount of information. And I will say over the years, this was a, still the same idea. How can we represent humanity and how we can use fundamentals of knowledge. And we just did this project called Arca Dreaming in 2016-17 for my residency at Google and transform 1.7 million documents in a library and all digitized, all metadata was able to like use in this immersive room. So what you are seeing is an audience in a library goes to this room and interacts with AI in real time by looking at these millions of images without a search bar, but by looking and trusting AI's connections between those documents and turning this into an experience as the audiovisual performance, as a VR, AR experience, as an XR experience. Archive Dreaming was the world's first, um, I guess, public installation where AI used uh, for the very first time. So I'm really grateful for this residency that allowed me and my team to deep dive into the world of AI. And after this project, last, I guess, seven years now, we trained more than 100 AI models. We download more than um, three, I guess, billion, which is more than two petabytes of raw data. And what is very inspiring to me is in this journey, as you may see, the data may change, the archive may change and the meaning may change. As you can see, our focus here is not humans, not private data, but something about collective memories, such as nature, space, um, urban, and culture that I do hope that is not for one only person, but for the collective consciousness of our humanity, our collective memories that builds up our humanity on top of it. And then you will see also another like uh, visual aesthetics that I have been like working very, very much last 10 years is I never believed that data as a pigment will be something will dry. In fact, 
it's always in flux, always in constant, always changing like life, like the sensors, like the hardware, software systems around us. I do believe that AI similarly, if one day can dream or hallucinate, which I'm calling it machine hallucinations, started almost seven years ago, the idea was the same. On the very left side, we are seeing a very much uh, raw AI dreaming uh, documents on the right side, transforming them into fluid dynamics uh, in a three-dimensional universe. So it's a seven years of research and I am seeing very similar works people are doing, but this is just for you to like <laughs> learn the fundamentals. And if you look at this video, last seven years is a major, major uh, research that transformed um, many different archives and AI models into different forms, functions, speed, color, texture. Like even though um, the question is like how machines could simulate unconscious and subconscious events such as dreaming, remembering and hallucinating, the answer is still unknown. But I believe that these paintings or sculptures or performances or installations are somehow relating themselves to this uh, exciting future where AI can dream, hallucinate the worlds where we can you know, see things we didn't see, making invisible visible. But again, it's not about mimicking nature. It's not about mimicking the reality. It's in fact trying to find something different, something new uh, based on our reality. So I just want to be sure about that's like the journey uh, of uh, finding a new alternative ways of seeing uh, I guess, perceiving the life. And if you look at AI here, like Rumi is a Persian poet who wrote in Mesnevi in 19 languages. But if you let AI to look at the same data and read it, what it understands is fascinating to me. Here we are seeing an, a UMAP algorithm, which is a uniform money, uh, uniform money, kind of a manifold projection of a multi-dimensional data into a more, I guess, preserved, perceivable dimension, in this case, six dimensions, which is the X, Y, Z coordinates of a data point mixed with the RGB, which is a, the color data of the information. And this to me is a fascinating way of looking at data, which I'm calling it data universe uh, last seven years. And this is a really inspiring topic, like even different, you know, concept here, we are looking Mozart. I mean, Mozart is a hero for humanity, for music, and it's his entire body of work. And again, using different algorithms, the same sound, the same, um, I guess, composition um, looks very different. Um, so again, it's his own works from, I think, 1784 to 91, um, but, but, it's, it's really exciting to see how AI feels and sees. Our, our other breakthrough, I guess, is very well known, was for New York 2018. And just a heads up, seven, 2017, I was very fortunate to start working with NVIDIA as an artist. And I'm very grateful for NVIDIA for many reasons. And Jensen Huang, the CEO, and, and behind many amazing breakthroughs. And, and they saw our, our, I think, our work. And, and they saw our power of like, you know, practicing and researching. And we start pushing the boundaries of not only AI, but also computer graphics. Here we are seeing our AI called uh, NYC, which is 118 million images of New York. And what we did is this created this alternative like New York by creating the GAN algorithm. And not only that, but also use at Artec House this um, um, kind of a audiovisual performance and installation the feeling of step inside the mind of AI. And so we are watching an 18 channel projectors, 32 channel sounds, the feeling of being in the mind of a machine. And this project was a major, um, major hit. Um, 
and especially in the art world in New York, uh, the impact of the work was incredibly powerful. And after that, we did many, many, many immersive projects. We did many like three-dimensional environments where AI data and architecture connects together and generative AI in general. The other project that we list, we were researching during pandemic is nature focus. I mean, nature is incredibly powerful inspiration. And our first one was a commissioned by Bulgari, uh, 2000, I mean, 2020, I will say, three years ago now. And our research was more focusing on these beautiful patterns of nature and such as flowers, flora systems. This AI train on 75 million flowers, pretty much every flower type that exists in 16,000 species. And we were able to create this powerful AI model, which can dream any flower that you can imagine in any form, in any color. But what was much inspiring to me was not only just creating the visual and the sound, again, created by an our um, sound data recordings of nature, we also asked the question, can we smell this dream of AI? Like, is there any way of like imagining the scent? And the good news is, as you see here, we invented this machine with Fermanich, which is a, I think now, 16 channel molecules, which is independent knots that can push this air into the room independently based on what AI can dream. So technically, when you open this door, when you enter this space, what you are seeing is AI is dreaming these new worlds of flowers or flora systems. Um, it was a very major, sub, very, very major reaction from the public. And I think it was in uh, Duomo in Milan and then London and then now in Madrid and going to like Seoul and Dubai and so, but it's public art. It's free and open to everyone that you can go in and see and feel these new ways of imagining with AI. And I love this term that Philip K. Dick says, reality is that it doesn't go away when you stop believing in it. A simulation is that which doesn't stop when the stories go away. Stories are responsible to our human desire for resolution, but a simulation is responsible only to its own laws and initializing conditions. A simulation has no moral prejudice or meaning. Like nature, it just is. So I love simulation so much and from the Philip Kedic perspective. And the same AI model, as you may see here, now I'm on a stage in real time, we are interacting with this model. Um, so we developed this new software called Latin Space Browser, which real time get the sound data and interact with this beautiful flower systems. And the same AI, in this case, in a different context. And this time, this is a trained, a custom model by using the Berlin um, nature data and transforming a public beacon, San Agnes Tower, into a three-dimensional project. And it's also an NFT project, by the way. When I talk about NFTs, people think that it's just, you know, a boring JPEG or a video, but it can be any form. It can be in a public space. It can be a sculpture. It can be this context of public art. And the other project, I think, as an NFT, when we think about the blockchain and how it was transforming our humanity last three years during the pandemic, especially, 
We were very fortunate to work with quantum AI team at Google, which were behind this uh, quantum supremacy uh, research test. And they were able to create this 53 qubit uh, quantum computation where they are called the SCAMOR processor, um, I guess they call it. And it was able to like create this massive new uh, research. And what we did is we helped the team to visualize these neural networks of independent like circuit depths between different, you know, states of, you know, qubits. And then we were able to visualize circuit depth um, in this real time um, and, and live labels of each circuit and their parameters and distance have been visualized. And they said it was a really, really inspiring software. And then they allow us to create this special, um, I guess, uh, research by using the quantum uh, research data sets and findings. I mean, if you're interested, there's an incredible um, research by Hugh Everett called Many Worlds Interpretation, very high level. Uh, every time we compute subatomic universe of quantum stage, there's a high chance to open a new dimension. But the question is, how can we visualize these new dimensions? Can we use AI to create these new dimensions or visualize these dimensions? And that was the quantum memories. So what we are watching is around 200 million molecules of nature, a data that I do believe is, again, very fundamental for quantum research, and using nature as a base model and to create this many worlds interpretation. And the project well received in pandemic in um, National Gallery of Victoria in Australia, in Melbourne, and then traveled around the world. And similarly, we explored another project called Gla um, Coral Dreams, which was for the Miami and two years ago at Art Basel. And this time we visualized the underwater world of corals, which were a more three-dimensional artwork in, the, in Miami. Another NFT project also in public space that made an impact, I think, in, in general in the art world. And then the other project I think right now that I, we are very, very excited. And now I think it's, a, it's an, a deep honor for me and my team that finally we were able to be in the history of uh, modern arts. Um, two years ago, uh, MoMA, Museum of Modern Arts, curators Michel Co and Paolo Antonelli, and uh, my hero and teacher, Casey Rias, uh, who is the founder of um, Processing with Ben Fry, who started this Processing Foundation, which is allowing many creators to use Java and, and, and object-based programming language to create uh, design or art or any interactive ideas you may imagine. And this was an incredible project because as obsessed with archives, and MoMA has one of the most amazing art collection you can imagine. For almost 200 years, MoMA is collecting the pioneers from different disciplines across like game, like Pac-Man and Tetris is in their collection, uh, videos like and paintings and sculptures. And it's an incredible archive of like multiple dimensional um, worlds. 
So what we did for this project, which is called Unsupervised, is an approach to AI that is doing something very different than a classical imagination of generative AI. So what we tried here is create a custom generative model where AI can learn from this metadata of 200 years of 138,000 artworks and come up with something, a unique form, but not necessarily create something realistic. So it's not about mimicking what we can think in reality of an art collection, but more about finding new ways of aesthetically connecting these new universes of hallucination of a machine while looking at this history of modern art. So the project started incredibly inspiring and the very good news, I guess, that it's on a public institution and on a public like domain place where the artwork is running almost last six months is November. And the other good news is the artwork is not just a static video. It is actually using a live data from the lobby, from a camera, microphone, and a weather station, which is creating a real time. So what you are seeing here is our software, which is developed in VBV. So we are literally seeing three chapters, three different chapters, and there are three different scenarios and a live demystifying how AI decides and creates those forms. What I love about this part is because AI is a very fundamental and powerful research, we always try to bring this kind of behind the scenes, what AI may see, what AI may dream and how these machine decisions are coming from. We do our best to like demystify how AI can imagine. Like it's a rainy day, windy day. We know that upper left UMAP image cluster will be a much fast returning like point. On the upper right, similarly, we have a 60 UMAP, you know, HDB scan of like the entire archive. It may react different. So the weather and the loudness or the, you know, the movement in the space truly like changes the what the, the uh, vision and, and the, how the AI can dream, I guess. So it was a really, really uh, fun, start that turned into a major project and we got uh, lots of critics 24 of them so far which is a i think major critic number and two of them was negative 22 was very positive i mean generally the negative also comes from gatekeepers i am calling them or dinosaurs <laughs> who are like a little bit against the newness reality of change and you know these are like very very fundamental things that i i mean if as a student or as a someone pushing the boundaries um, it's very common to see uh, like those gatekeepers uh, across the fields science art and technology so but at the end i think our work now in the collection in the history there's three artworks And lastly, I want to finish this presentation with another inspiring project um, that we just finished last year. And I, 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 if you're in Barcelona, 5th of May, we are redoing this project called Casa Batio, which is a living architecture. And the project was on a building in Barcelona in one of the most inspiring architects of our time, Gaudi, Antoni Gaudi. And he said like something very powerful. Originality consists in returning to the origin, those that which is original returns to the simplicity of the first solutions. And I love this idea of like fundamentals. And as you may guess, for living architecture, I thought that perhaps we can create this artwork by using a real-time data from the building to give it a life. If there is a world of metaverse, multiverse, whatever verse this we call it, a world where the physical and virtual connects.
the project started as like a really inspiring research and then and, and finding a way of like uh, representing the Gaudis, this beautiful facade that he made. So we took literally a one billion parameter a LIDAR point cloud of the facades and then merged it with a, like a real-time weather station where we can get the wind direction, temperature, humidity, and pressures in atmosphere, rain, solar, and many information you can imagine. Like here we can see on the very left side, we have the wind patterns in the center, we have the like the rain conditions on the very right side, more windy or rainy day, where the combination makes this more building and alive and changing and transforming. I'm really very, very inspired by Gaudi himself and really imagine where we can push the boundaries of architecture, where we can push the boundaries of imagination with when the AI, you know, architecture, when the data and the light becomes a material um, and of course this cannot happen in physical world because of Neoconian reality and preserving the physical ideas but in metaverse or data or dataverse or multiverse whatever we call it bananaverse it can be much different and it can be where the ideas can become more fun and beyond what we can imagine and to celebrate this idea we didn't just do a visual representation on simple way we get out of our comfort zone and make an audiovisual performance on the facade of the building last year. So, so this project was one of our like really highlight points where I found that a connection with the public space becomes a powerful research and then brings more attention across the world. But now the question is, what can we do with this attention and how can we turn this value of energy and attention to, um, to something meaningful and purposeful? And after many years of research, I just decided to, it's time to go back to fundamentals. And I was very fortunate to be invited by a wonderful family, Yavanava, which uh, in, in Brazil's beautiful Amazonia in Acre. And I, we, were highlight, we were truly um, invited by, by the family, by the chief Nishivaka and Futani. And, and I'm extremely honored and deeply honored to work with them closely to create something meaningful. And I'm calling it uh, Data Land, which is a new ways of imagining data and we are hoping to create one of the world's largest rainforest uh, attention uh, to create some meaningful projects together, performances, um, and help them to preserve their language, their culture, and co-create together and to use AI for something purposeful and meaningful. So thank you very much for listening and happy to get your uh, questions and dive into details. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rick. It's truly inspiring to see your presentation. Let me put myself here in uh, spotlight as well as Marcos here. Thanks so much. 
Can you give me a second? Awesome. I'll just get it. I'll just get a water quickly. One minute. No problem. No session. problem. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Happy to hear, happy to get questions. Awesome. So uh, as I was saying, it was truly impressive, the work that you, you have been doing. So that's why I wanted to have the opportunity to have you here to talk to, to the students and to inspire them uh, to work with computer science. Because as I always say, computer science now is like uh, in the middle of everything. And yeah. AI is now in the middle of everything. So it's Finally. like, uh, it's not just, <laughs> It's like present in everything that we do. I, I would like with a, a provocative question because uh, this is um, something that I was thinking about yesterday. So as an artist working um, in this conjunction of real and virtual worlds, and also seeing the developments of uh, AI pretty much in the last 10 to 12 years, which is basically the time that I've been a professor as well, how do you see the evolution of these generative uh, AI algorithms? How do you see them impacting positively and or negatively the work that you do? Yes, I think first of all, working with AI for seven years feels like a 70 years. It's so fast, <laughs> it's so ever changing. And I'm not a computer scientist. I am just an artist enjoying the you know creativity with machines. But even though um, I'm not a scientist, I found it much engaging in my mind since day one. So 100% there are problems that we are seeing. And I'm very happy to be in the OpenAI's beta tester or Brad's, Brad's or Bart's or however you call it, the Google's one and, and ChatGPT. And I mean, it's great to be in the same bubble of these people who are creating these worlds. But I'm seeing a lot of problems in the diffusion models that I saw um, there was a very significant backlash from a group of artists who have been extremely annoyed by the idea of their work was a part of data sets. And there is no single way to discuss it with anyone. I mean, if someone says, like, I don't want my six, seven years of work to be on the hands of someone in a couple of seconds or milliseconds, they generate the same thing I do for many years. Like, if that someone is really, really annoyed by this or feel, you know, harmed by this. There is no way for someone to engage and discuss. So I totally agree that the people who feel um, affected um, by this, I, I hear them and I understand them. Um, but at the meantime, I mean, if we go to a gallery or a museum as a human, we inspire from things and we come back to our you know, working conditions and do things by our own capacity. So I do believe that generative AI is just an extension of mind. It's just extension of creativity. Um, I don't see harm unless, again, there are rules and ethical understanding. I don't think the world is aware of what data collection means, what truly like, you know, how to make these models. Like, you know, even OpenAI right now, because of, I guess, um, Microsoft or whatever reasons, they don't even like highlight the parameter numbers. They don't even highlight where, like, like we can start seeing a race between companies and they are starting to like not anymore share how these models are done. So that's to me is more dangerous than, oh, it's a doom day coming, AI will take over. Like I don't believe that part because I do believe that these models will create more work. They will create more attention. They will create more time for creativity. But I believe that there is some room for, researchers to explain where data comes from, why this bias is there, 
why that you know work is there so i mean this is the only part i feel the weakness but on the, on the other hand image sound text video everything is changing constantly like just today adobe announced their creative tool i mean every single day a new idea pops up i think it's fascinating but fundamentally it's all about as i mentioned in my presentation i think the future we are going for is all about questioning creativity it's all about understanding where creativity comes from and how it happens and of course questioning it and second is who will define what is real or not and i think it's where we are going and i don't know the answer but i know where we are going <laughs> very good points thank you i'm gonna go over some of the questions here uh felipe yeah. diaz asking asks like uh what advice uh do you have uh, for someone who wants to become an ai artist yes. i think being an ai artist is a very inspiring process but it's not easy anymore <laughs> because prompting an image or like, you know, having a conversation with some AI and turn it into a book or an article or a movie. I don't believe it's just art. It's a study. I do believe art is unfortunately or fortunately happens after what AI may propose. My guess is the value for creativity with AI or a human machine collaboration will only be probably well received and respected and value given when the human has beyond just prompting an idea i think what ai proposes us is not a finale it's a start point and what do we do with that is the art part and i think we should be just careful that that comfort zone of prompting something will not create an easy solution for becoming an artist. Again, this is based on what I heard from the curators, museums and galleries. Um, we should put, bring also a human part of creativity beyond finding the words uh, or prompts that is needed. That's very good point. And uh, this goes in the direction of uh, a recent uh, dialogue that I've seen from Eric Brin Jobson from MIT. Uh, he was asked if AI was replacing all of the jobs or many jobs. And he said, my understanding is that AI is going to replace jobs of people who don't want to work with AI. So if you are a journalist and you don't work with AI, probably you have a problem because another journalist working with AI will be more powerful and we will have access to tools that you don't have. I think this is the same for artists. Uh, an artist that does not use AI for anything, uh, perhaps, I'm not saying that, perhaps these artists will have to find new ways of surprising uh, uh, what, about what he does or she does. So Kayo asks also um, if you have the kind of tools that you normally use in your day-to-day -day, uh, artistic creations. Like it seems that uh, you mentioned generative models. You mentioning uh, you mentioned like um, bringing the data to visualization. But what kind of tools do you normally use? I mean, right now in the studio, of course, I love GAN algorithm, generative adversarial networks. I do believe that. They have an incredible quality of imagination while the movements and fluidity and, you know, interacting with multi layers of like noise layers and using our multi million image archives. I still believe the GAN models are noble. But of course, I mean, diffusion models, uh, as we all know, Runme ML and Stability AI have been pushing the stable diffuse models are incredible. We are fine tuning them and experimenting with them. And we are creating our own AI models through that pipelines. It's super inspiring. Um, and, but additionally, of course, like conversational AIs are fun, but I don't find very quickly how we can use them um, in a way, an artistic novel ways. Um, but I do believe that diffuse models are really, really inspiring and creating a major impact. Um, so they are all available, all online, all free, and some of them are service, but, you know, they are there to experiment with injuring some prompts. Great. I have a question, a curiosity, uh, actually, from Pedro. Um, how big was the team that worked behind the scenes for the Barcelona uh, presentation for Casa Platlo? Yeah, the Casa Patio is a really big push. And again, the family who owns the building super amazing family who just 
you know, believes the future by preserving the culture and history. It's an incredible mind. I think it's exactly the minds we need for many historic places. Um, they are respecting the Gaudi, they are respecting the culture, they are respecting the building, but still questioning how to bring attention to the value of the building and history. Um, so they are one team. The second team is our team in the studio in Los Angeles. Um, and the third team is on site. We hire a local AV team. We use six projectors each, <coughs> 50,000 luminance. Uh, we have a major sound system. We have a real-time scent augmentation. The building had an AI scent. Um, it was really fun. It was really fun to bring all these different disciplines together, architecture, public space, history, UNESCO heritage, AI, data, <laughs> all together. That's it was a very good. like a fun, fun, uh, fun experience. That's very good. I have now a, a question here from Marcos here. Um, thank you very much for the amazing presentation. I'd like to ask, how do you think about the connection or lack of connection between the art and the spectators? I mean, would the public yeah. know which AI model was used yeah. uh, to each sorts of arts that are presented? Don't you think that this may lead to moving back to natural beauty? So I think in my mind, anyone working with AI, anyone preserving AI as a research tool has to be, has to be definitely public. So I did my very best in my any project with AI to highlight the name of the algorithm, the name of the model, where data comes from, you know, everything de demystified while it created my copycats, which is fine. But at the meantime, I learned that it's possible to demystify AI tools. Like at Momo Project, we have clearly have a NVIDIA support. We have a DJ station running real time to compute an AI, you know, mission decisions. Um, in our coral dreams, we use our custom diffuse model to train a custom model for the coral data, which is very important because, you know, every project I do keynotes, share behind the scenes. Our, we have a project right now here in Los Angeles. We similarly explain we have a process wall, like which is the biggest artwork to learn behind the scenes. I do believe it's important for a public if they are interested to learn more. And this information should be available. So at least it's there for people asking. And my guess is because the attention is so high to our works or this, this, this medium, I think it's more important than before to really highlight what type of AI is this. Um, I think it's okay. a responsibility. By the way, in the history, artists never have been like in this pressure. Not, none of the painters or sculptors or, you know, they, they never show their studios. They never show how they do these techniques. Um, but I don't believe it's anymore that's the case. There is this bigger responsibility people working with art, science, and technology, I think. That's good. Uh, as we are a team of uh, AI researchers, uh, some students are, they, they are questioning here, and also my colleague here, Pedro, a uh, researcher in the lab, when we mentioned the team, it's because um, you need to train lots of models. You need to collect data, as you mentioned, like a two petabytes of data. So typically, <laughs> when you get a new project like this, uh, how do you how do you do? You you get like a ten people working day and night to train these models and use the cloud yeah. Nvidia. How do you do? Yeah. So I mean, basically, again, 2016 when I started Google, we got an amazing support. How to use Google Cloud. Because by the way, Google Cloud is my personal favorite because of it's a completely renewable energy. Thanks to DeepMind team, Demis's team, they were able to optimize the entire usage of power and they are using completely renewable energy, which, which, I, which is very important for us for nature harm and be sure that we can quantify what we do. And then NVIDIA friends, when they we start working on the Gamescom and other like algorithms like RTX and so on, they donated us DGX stations. Like we have an amazing like DJ extension in the studio with 800s and, you know, like pretty eight gigabyte beefy GPUs where we compute a lot of stuff locally. Um, so we have the both local and the both cloud support based on the research. Um, and But we are like only, again, 15 people and, and six of us is heavily focused on data and ML, machine learning part. 
um, all local, all in-house. And we are not like going bigger intentionally because it's an art studio. Like we don't do product or service or those kind of stuff. We just make art. So everyone is aware of what's going on, all the parameters, all the numbers, all the models, collapse models, lots of collapse models. <laughs> and then also like things that are happening magically. Great. So, but um, it's a lot of work. Yes. Um, but being a small really brings a lot of attention and focus. I do believe very good. It. Two last questions. Um, yes. We we have like you started with images and then you slowly move it to like motion and then you brought sound and then you brought synth. Yes. So you are creating this immersive experience, right? So what do you see it's missing and do you that you anticipate to increase even more this degree of immersiveness in your yeah. art pieces i mean great question i mean again i'm inspired by simulation the idea of simulacra and then try to create these you know worlds around the concepts and i think what is missing is to me is not just v first of all i have a problem with vr I mean, I love VR, I love XR, I love AR, but they are so in between stages that you have to convince yourself that you are wearing a TV on your face and you are moving and the world around you is like computing based on your, you know, location. And so that part, I don't, I, I can't convince myself that it's, <laughs> it's the ultimate space. So that's why I find it more inspiring to be in a physical world, like physical world. Yeah, but what about the haptics? They are great, but still you are wearing these giant things. Like they are not in the neural space. It's it's just another machine you wear. I mean, I understand till we go to the like neural <laughs> neural pathways, there will be a things to wear and you know simulate things. But I still really wishing to work with like brain computer interface like VCIs. So I'm really, really very inspired by them. Um, like BlackRock or Neuralink, like all that great people trying to make things. That's my personal joy of understanding our, um, I guess, cognitive capacity. Um, I think we jump, we jump so fast to the tools like VR, AR, XR, but not necessarily they are making me inspired yet. Um, okay. I, I'm on board. <laughs> Really, yeah, very nice. Uh, last question. You mentioned that uh, one of your inspirations uh, was the Library of Babel from Borges. Yeah. Uh, I love Borges. Yes. Um, have you uh, ever thought of creating something uh, of another work of him, uh, the Aleph, that has the answers to everything? <laughs> I'm very, very, I mean, I, I think it's, a, it's, it's pretty much a conversational AI research. It's a great input. And I was really thinking when the, you know, chat GPT popped up, I was like, oh my God, this is becoming like very Borgesian world. The first library yeah. of Babel and like, you know, yeah, I mean, very much. I mean, I, I wish we have more installations like this around the world uh, because I still believe that AI is very elitist for really very few people in the world is really understanding it. Um, you know, maybe a couple of million people in focus, other couple of million people, maybe just hearing the hype, but not necessarily, you know, the world is ready and we are 8 billion people like it's <laughs> it's a major difference uh, but maybe those stories may help us opera performing arts installations in museums may allow us to explain the uh what's coming up next all right so Rafik, thanks a lot uh, once thank, again thank uh, for for being here with us today thanks everyone for joining thanks marcus thank once again for the partnership yes. and By stay way, safe everyone by the way, uh, if anyone interested in our rainforest research in, in Accra in many places, I'm so happy to work with, with people also from beautiful Brazil. I mean, I'm, I love your country. I love your culture so much. Uh, so, if Would you like to say some words about this project? It's, uh, it's <laughs> up to you. Yes. I mean, generally, we are creating our own AI model, custom uh, rainforest model with the flora and fauna. But it's hopefully will be open source once you know, the research is done. But the whole ultimate goal is to approach the rainforest as much as um, as deep as possible, as ethical as mm -hmm. possible. Um, we are training, um, you know, local local Yavanava people, but it's it's their capacity is limited, and they have other things to do in life. I mean, they are small family. 
uh, even though I'm doing my best and we got Apple support for their first laptops, their first cameras, I mean, I'm doing our best. But at the meantime, um, it needs a lot of push from our side to be sure the artwork is extremely high capacity. Um, so if anyone interested, we are, you know, they're not trying to learn coding, of course, but they want to preserve their culture, like their drawings, their, you know, fundamental things they do with like their tools, uh, their flora fauna systems. And there's a lot of things to do with them. Um, and the language is a barrier for me. I wish I know <laughs> more, but English and Turkish is not enough to communicate. I mean, from, from, and we are also working with PyTorch community to preserve their language, for example. Um, for example, like how can we, pre there are only 17 people can talk their language, but can we use AI to like preserve the language? No, you know, there are so many questions. There are so many things to do. Um, so if anyone interested to be a, a part of the project, we are looking for not only interns, like real researchers, like don't, we don't worry about the age or the experience. We, we just look for team members. Um, and how to get in touch with you or your team to be part of this collaboration? Uh, I can use chat uh, to, oh yes. wow, there's a lot of things in the chat, sorry, I, I'm just seeing it. Uh, this is my email address, and I'm very happy if anyone interested, who has like, you know, English, Portuguese, like, I mean, we have this lots of like things challenging, very challenging uh, in dialogue, again, challenging research. Uh, we are looking for amazing rainforest data, and we are looking for many things. I mean, um, the, it's diverse research. There is no like limits. And then we have an amazing team in already Sao Paulo and Rio try to create at least um, to be sure to, you know, 3D scan forest, you know, do beautiful photogrammetry, nerves, which is an amazing research. Now with image archives. I mean, so many things. I'm open to many things. That's great. That's great. One one thing that's interesting, uh, Unicamp here, we, we created about five years ago a special uh, inclusion program for indigenous people and Amazing. every year now we are accepting about 100 or 120 students and in computer science and computer engineering it's about at least four per year so i'm gonna check if any of these students is from the specific this uh, people that yeah. uh, that you mentioned, yeah, yeah one so. hour. I mean, amazing family. I mean, I mean, I'm sure everyone is amazing in there, but I, that's the only family I met, um, and and I have a really beautiful, special uh, connection with them, uh, respectfully. So anyway, I mean, I'm very happy to. I mean, you have you have magic in 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 many places. So how to make the world <laughs> be aware of this? Awesome, great, thanks uh, once again. And uh, good luck and success. I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of success in, the, in, the, in your new projects. And remember, uh, critiques in art, it's always there. <laughs> it's been always there. Remember the impressionists, like uh, they were baptized by the critics. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you so much and enjoy your Thank journey you. as well, everyone here and hope to sing together anywhere in the world. Thank you so much. Thank have a great you. day. Bye-bye. Great to meet you. Bye -bye. Bye-bye. Everyone, thank you. Bye-bye.